My name is Alexis Brown, and this is my speech on end of life care. All right. So, have you given any thought on how you were going to die? Today, I'm going to talk to you about the process of death and leading up to it and the care you will receive. The topic is of value because death is inevitable for us and our close family members. Our parents and close family members and ourselves will need to make decisions on medical personnel and all the care that will lead up to our death. When the time comes, it's best to know how to handle the situation and the care options that are available to us. I've had two great grandmothers go through end of life care from start to finish, and it is something that I have gained a passion for and it's something I have enjoyed watching and what has created my passion for occupational therapy. Um, the work they put into improving their quality of life is something that I respect and something that I want to have other people do just to improve their quality of life and their relationships with their family members. Um, my great-grandfather died shortly before I was born and he did a hospice clinic in his home and it was such a blessing to my family and it's something that they still talk about today. Being able to die peacefully at home is something that my family treasures and something they would not trade. I'm passionate about the topic and I want you all to have some insight onto end-of-life care and what occupational therapy can do in end-of-life care. First, I'm going to explain to you what end-of-life care is, the issue of end-of-life care, and how occupational therapy is used to combat these issues. And if illness held you back, what would you want done for you? All right, so. First off, what is end-of-life care? Um, choosing to be an end-of-life care is something you do when treatment options have run out, such as your cancer treatment has stopped working or you've had a severe stroke. Um, Healthguide.com.org um, recommends hospice care. If the benefits of treatment have stopped, you'd rather be at home than in a hospital, and you've decided to stop receiving treatment for your disease. Um, in end-of-life care, there are many disciplines working to make the final stage enjoyable. Um, such as the ones you can see on the board. The American Occupational Therapy Association um, gives these certain professions. Um, they work to provide care for the family as well as the patient and all aspects of their care. The place of care is also of importance. Um, hospice, um, hospitals, and nursing homes, as well as the patient homes, are all options to be treated in. Most people prefer their home because it is familiar and their familiar things are there as well as their family. Um, secondly, I'm going to explain the issue with end of life care. Um, a personal story off of SeniorCareOrganizer.com explains the benefits that hospice care provides when the client is too weak to function. Little things are provided like a mat under the bed so the patient does not fall. Um, but all facilities are not this well equipped and they might not have the accessibility to all clients which is one of the issues with end-of-life care. With death becoming closer, it might be difficult for people to connect to their family members, and they're only waiting, watching, and depression can set in. Hopelessness can become a focal point of their final days. The American Occupational Therapy Association states that when facing a life-threatening illness, um, your skills can fade, such as illness, or such as motor, sensory, emotional, and cognitive and communication skills. So by improving these skills, you can technically have a better quality of life. Um, the last issue with end-of-life care is boredom. Um, patients reaching the end of their lives, there's a state of defeat. They stop wanting to do what they used to do, and their passions start to fade. Um, Hospiceworld.org states that boredom and lack of interest is one of the big issues. Um, basic skills such as dressing, cooking, gardening, anything that someone would want to do start to fade, and they start to lose their passion for living, essentially. Um, with this, self-worth and depression take over, and life becomes more of a waste than the gift that it is. Um, so, completing tasks is something that is important to people. Um, having something to look forward to is something that occupational therapy does for end-of-life care. Um, which brings to the final point, um, there is a discipline that helps fight this hopelessness in end-of-life care. Um, Carla Holst, who writes an occupational therapy blog, and her team start to get to know their patients' interests, which helps them retain passion and excitement about life. Completing these tasks helps them go back to normal daily living and leisure activities. 
Um, even if a function isn't fully restored, they start to see more vigor in the people and their life starts to improve greatly. Um, in our article, she stated that leisure can be a powerful tool to decrease physical and emotional pain as well as anxiety. Um, AOT al AOTA also states that play and leisure are the two things that the body needs um, to reduce stress. Um, when clients can do things for themselves, they also start to reach a benefit, which is something that occupational therapy can do for them. Um, all right, so in conclusion, today we talked about the three main aspects, what end-of-life care is, the issues in end-of-life care, and how occupational therapy is used to combat these issues. Um, I hope that my personal experience, as well as my examples, have created a better understanding for you in what end-of-life care is and how the issues can be fought. Um, I hope you now understand why I want to work in the occupational therapy field in end-of-life care.